That's good. Yep. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for those of you who are joining us here um, in Sheldon Hall, as well as those who are joining us online uh, to um, discuss this incredibly important and timely topic. Uh, last Monday, uh, two large earthquakes uh, struck Turkey and Syria, as we all know. It is the worst such disaster in Turkey and um, since 1999, and the latest um, death toll is is exceeding 36,000 people, just devastating, and it continues to climb. As you know, we have many people in our school community who have loved ones and ties uh, to the program uh, and ties to the region, and I want you to know that our hearts are with you, and for all of us here, this is a tragedy that deserves our closest attention. So I would ask um, that we do take a moment um, of silence uh, to remember those whose lives uh, that were lost. So I know many of us are watching, closely watching the news um, as the heartbreaking situation continues to unfold. Uh, there is no doubt this is a massive humanitarian crisis. Beyond the deaths and injuries, the destruction has left hundreds of thousands of people homeless. People are suffering from cold, from hunger, and from lack of medical care. For Syrians, the earthquake only compounds the suffering that so many people have endured uh, in their civil war. When faced with a disaster of this magnitude, it's vital that we listen to the voices of the public health community. And today we will hear from faculty and students who have, been de who have dedicated their lives and careers to understanding the best ways to help in crises just like these. I am grateful um, to everyone who is sitting on our panel today, uh, especially our students who call uh, the, these regions their home. Your professional and personal perspectives are invaluable at this moment, and I look forward to hearing from you in particular. So I'll begin by introducing Paul Spiegel. I think many, most of you know uh, Paul. He is a professor of the practice and director of the school's Center for Humanitarian Health. He's an expert on mitigating and responding to complex humanitarian emergencies. And just this last year, he traveled overseas to lead the Ukraine refugee response for WHO. We are so fortunate to have Paul and the center uh, housed within the School of Public Health. They continue to do just incredible work uh, that is so vital to our mission uh, here in the, it, for, the, for the field of public health. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul and look forward to um, the conversation. Paul? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean McKenzie. And thanks to all of you coming in person and um, who are online. Um, I feel quite honored to, to have uh, my colleagues and, and fellow faculty and students um, who have been not just professionally, of course, affected, but very much personally affected. And so today, um, with some urging from uh, the advisory committee at the Center for Humanitarian Health, we wanted to have um, more of a personal, in many ways, a, a Hopkins-led um, response in terms of what happened how people have been affected and how personally um, many of our, our students and faculty have been affected um, by this, this horrible disaster. So we're going to start and have, um, I'm gonna introduce the, the panel, take about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, there are two mics uh, in the corner there and we'll also take from, uh, from those online. So I'll introduce everyone um, directly and then we'll start with Gilbert Burnham. So. Many of you, of course, know Gilbert Burnham, professor of, in international health, and um, he founded the Center for Humanitarian Health many years ago. And for some years now, Gilbert has been working in Ghazi and Tep, Turkey on projects across the border in Northwest Syria. Uh, and these have included access and quality of medicines, improving hemodialysis, and with uh, Bar Bara Zaheli, and on improving post-operative care in hospitals in Northwest Syria. Now, next is, is Bara, Bara Zaheli, who is a full-time Syrian-American vascular surgeon at Michigan State University on the Flint campus. He's also a part-time MPH student uh, here at Bloomberg. 
He has a special interest in global health and high quality surgical care in low and middle income uh, countries specifically. And he's going back and forth uh, to Ghazi and uh, Turkey, working with, uh, with Gilbert Burnham. Fortunately for him, he was actually, uh, unfortunately, sorry, I don't know if I said fortunately, unfortunately for him, being quite serious, he was actually there in Gaziantep when the earthquake happened. And he'll tell you a little bit uh, about what happened. And also, thankfully, Hopkins and Marie Diener West and Gilbert Burnham and many others had a big hand in, in um, uh, medevacking him, thankfully, uh, in, in safety. Next, uh, we have Amani Kadur. Um, Amani, wave. Um, Amani is the executive director of the humanitarian NGO Syria Relief and Development, or SRD, and she's led a team of over 2,000 staff on the ground. She is based in, in Gaziantep, but uh, thankfully for her, she was uh, in the U.S. at the time. She's also a, a DRPH candidate here, and um, I have the pleasure or privilege of working up with Amani very closely, and we head off to Mali in, uh, on Friday for another project. She's also an associate at Johns Hopkins. Aral uh, Zermeli. Aral um, is currently in New York, but he's a he's a Turkish MD MPH, and he's the executive director of Hira Digital Health. It's a uh, it aims to provide access to healthcare services and refugees in populations in a digital manner. He founded the first Turkish medical rescue nonprofit called Medak, uh, and works in humanitarian aid. He's also a, a second year DRPH student, um, and he's working on some really interesting uh, digital apps uh, on personal medical records and vaccinations. Um, he also, like Amani, um, has, has been uh, very much affected by what's happened on a personal level as well. So it's my pleasure to, to have you all, and I really thank you because this is not an easy topic. It's not just professional for you. It's also very personal. We'll start with Gilbert, uh, who will introduce uh, some of the key aspects, and then we'll move on to Bara. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, I thought we'd start off first with a little bit of context so we understand where we are and what we're talking about. So we can see in the background here the map of the affected area from the CDC, and you can see that the majority of the uh, affected area was in southern Turkey, but uh, it spilled over into northern Syria as well. And I should point out that historically, this border between the two countries has moved back and forth over the centuries. So uh, it's not strictly historically Syria or strictly historically Turkey. Uh, what's also interesting in this is the areas in uh, in the Turkish side on the south uh, and our east Anatolian fault is a very highly populated area. And also in inside Syria, the area around Aleppo, and then to the west uh, around Idlib is one of the most heavily populated areas, uh, uh, probably second only to Damascus in the population size. So we're talking about a fairly large number of people that were affected by this particular uh, event. And here we can see a map of where the affected areas of Turkey are. And you can see if you're planning your holiday, there are not many options if you want to avoid a area that is uh, uh, potentially affected by uh, by earthquakes. Uh, the, the line along the top is the North uh, Anatolian Fault, and that's where the majority of the uh, seismic activities have happened over the last uh, uh, several decades. And the uh, you can see the the tri the, the uh, rectangles there showing the locations. And the one near Istanbul on the far left, 1999, that was the Izmir uh, earthquake, which killed probably 17,000 people then. And up until now was the most severe experience that uh, that uh, Turkey has had with earthquakes in some er area. And then you can see down in the bottom there, uh, around, you can see Gaziantep, and that's on the east and Anatolian fault. And, uh, this has not had much activity in recent years, but seismologists had already detected a lot of tensions building up here. So this earthquake in some ways was not an absolute surprise to people. Uh, then if we look a bit more closely, we can see uh, the, the epicenter there with Gaziantep and then uh, affecting northwest uh, Syria. And this uh, Gaziantep is important, as we'll talk about, for northwest Syria because 
This has been the headquarters of much of the aid operations for uh, Northwest Syria, uh, crossing over into the areas uh, there from, from Turkey, both from the United Nations side of things, as well as many of the non-government organizations, which are really responsible for keeping much of what's going on in uh, Northwest Syria functioning. <clears throat> and then if we look at the top here, we'll get a political map here. So the area in purple is the area controlled by the Assad regime. And uh, then you can see in the uh, northwest side and the upper left-hand side, the areas that are controlled by the opposition uh, forces. And there's an informal truce going on now. So there's not so much conflict as there was previously, but there's close to 4.6 million people living in this area. So a fairly densely populated area and having a lot of financial and economic difficulties at the moment. Uh, the yellow area at the top is the area that's occupied by Turkey. Uh, and uh, Turkey has taken a lot of the responsibilities for functioning there. Uh, and then the other areas uh, to, the, uh, to the Iraq side on the east, uh, these are areas controlled by Kurdish forces and the population density here is actually pretty low. So the big population densities around Aleppo and Northwest uh, Syria really put this country at serious risk uh, in this current situation. So just to say in at a moment that although we can look at this as a um, as a major natural uh, hazard that's occurred, <clears throat> politics played a major role in the vulnerabilities and sensitivities, both on the Syrian side and on the Turkish side as well. And the Syrian side had very little uh, economic assistance except to cross the border from Turkey. Uh, there was a area affected in the regime controlled area and it's received some assistance from its allies in uh, in Russia and other places uh, but the uh, northwest Syria area was really uh, kind of devoid of assistance there was only one official crossing point and that crossing point was damaged seriously uh, by the earthquake, so it was a long delay. And one can also imagine that in an emergency like this, we're not thinking about moving heavy machinery across the border, which is really necessary for uh, rescuing people in Northwest Syria, because all of that machinery was already occupied in, uh, in, in Turkey. Then we look at the vulnerabilities on the Turkish side. And as some of you know, the economic situation in Turkey is not doing well. Inflation rate now is down to 60% from close to 90% uh, last year and sometimes um, because of various economic policies. Uh, on the other hand, after the Izmir uh, earthquake, Turkey put into place some really strict uh, building standards. And then they upgraded them several times subsequently. And these, as they like to point out, in some points, even exceed the the building the building criteria for California. So they did a great job at putting this into place. The problem was nobody enforced it, or it was minimally enforced, uh, and very little inspection. And further to complicate things, if you constructed a substandard building, you could pay a certain amount of money and get amnesty. Uh, so you could kind of buy off your, your sins, as it were, and this was a major source of income for the government. And in fact, just before this earthquake, the government was proposing another amnesty to further generate income for government. In addition, there was uh, earthquake tax after the Izmir earthquake, and this money was supposed to be used for retrofitting um, substandard buildings. But uh, it seems that nobody knows exactly where this money went, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of retrofitting going on. So we're seeing here from the Turkey side a major, a major systemic failure in the uh, and the enforcement of building codes. And we know from the public health standpoint in earthquakes, building codes are one of the most powerful things that we can do to protect populations. So on paper it was there, but in reality, it wasn't there. Now on the Northwest Syria side, uh, as of yesterday, we now have two more official uh, openings for crossing from Turkey into uh, into Northwest Syria, both of these in the Turkish controlled parts of Northwest Syria. So officially we can move more things across 
as providing assistance. So at this point, it's tents, it's food, it's uh, shelter and, and warmth and so forth. Uh, there's been some moving across through uh, informal uh, crossings in the border anyway, but uh, at least this now looks like we can help more in the reconstruction process than, uh, than we could have uh, a few days ago. Great, thank you very much, Gilbert. Um, we're going to move to Bara now. Um, Bara, we, we try, even though we work in humanitarian health, we try not to be at the epicenter of, uh, of the events that, you know, if we can avoid it. Unfortunately, you were not able to avoid it. Um, so we'd like to hear both what it was like, um, but also in terms of both a professional and, and personal level, what, what happened? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So I, I will talk about my personal experience, not for me to steal the spotlight. I think the spotlight should go in Turkey and in Syria. But just to show you, if I struggled this much when I was there, despite the enormous help I got from Marie and Gilbert, hopefully that will give you an idea of what is the real struggle for people there. So the, as you know, the earthquake happened around 4.30 a.m. Um, I was awake at the time because I was jet lagged. I just arrived to Turkey. So it was 7 p.m. my time in the U.S. So I was awake. I was about to have dinner when the whole thing started. Now, I've been in an earthquake before. I've witnessed five degree earthquake before about 20 years ago, and that was horrifying. So I've always prayed and hoped that I will never, ever, ever live to witness any five plus earthquake in my life. It didn't go well. It didn't go well. So the minute the shaking started, it was very obvious that this is not a simple earthquake. It wasn't five plus. It was something way beyond that. So because I was awake, um, it didn't take me long to escape the hotel. Um, I managed to grab my cell phone and my wallet, which we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, I went outside half of my hotel. Um, it's an old part of the castle got destroyed, but I managed to escape before it collapsed on me or in, on any of, of the other um, people there. Um, what's, what's really interesting, and I heard that before, and they didn't believe it, but now I believe it. What's more difficult than the earthquake is the aftershock that comes after the earthquake. I didn't believe it before, but now I'm a firm believer because with every aftershock, there is a significant amount of uncertainty that comes with it. So there were about 800 people where I was outside between the castle in front of us and the old city at the back. So with every aftershock, part of the castle came down and some of the walls in the old city collapsed. So we were stuck there wondering what to do. And there was about an aftershock every two, three minutes. Each aftershock lasted about 15, 20 seconds. It felt like forever, but it lasted very short Part of the castle will collapse and would hear some of the walls in the old city collapsing as well. So the uncertainty that came with that was enormous because we didn't know, should we go back through the old city, risking one of the walls collapsing on us? Or should we stay where we are, risking that the whole castle could collapse on us? And if that happens, we are gone. Luckily, neither one happened. We stayed where we are and the castle did not collapse. After all of that happened, I was like, great, I'm a trauma surgeon, I'm a vascular surgeon, I am the right guy in the right location at the right time. Let me help. Unfortunately, it didn't work out this way. I spent the next three to four hours going around the local hospitals, see if, I, if anyone would take my services as a vascular or trauma surgeon. It's very complicated, the language barrier, the, the logistic, but it didn't work out. Um, I offered my services, multiple people, Again, with the language and cultural barrier, I was useless there. So I said, sure, no big deal. Um, I am. I was born and raised in Syria. I'm sure I'm going to be extremely helpful in Syria. So I started reaching out to my contacts across the borders to see if they can take me inside Syria to help out. That didn't turn out to be as simple as I thought. For security reasons, that goes beyond the discussion here. You can go inside Syria where it is controlled by a terrorist organization at that location, but you cannot go back without security clearance. The security clearance takes anything from five to seven days before the earthquake. So for me to go inside Syria means I will be stuck inside Syria for unknown period of time. 
So I didn't do that either. That whole thing took about eight hours for me to reach that conclusion that I am absolutely useless in either location. By one o'clock, I was still running around. And I forgot to mention one thing. At the time of the earthquake, it was actively snowing. There was already about half an inch of snow of the time. And the degree, it was about 25 to 28 Fahrenheit. Now, I live in Michigan, so 25 Fahrenheit is not bad. But <laughs> at the time of the earthquake, that turns out to be a significant inconvenience. So, and within about an hour of the earthquake, the snow has turned into a rain. So by the time I figure out that I'm used this both in Turkey and in Syria, it was about 1 p.m. I was still going around in the city trying to figure out what to do with my life. At around 1.30 p.m., the second earthquake hit. Um, luckily, I was outside. Um, I, I saw something I would never want to see again in my life, but given my history, I, I cannot guarantee that. But literally, you can see a whole building, eight-story building, literally shaking from one side to the other. Luckily, it didn't collapse, but again, that's something I, I, I hope I never see again in my life. By one theory, we got the second earthquake. I'm, I'm, I'm still running around trying to figure out what to do. Still actively raining. By two o'clock, I'm, I'm drenched in water. I'm soaked in water because I've been outside in my pajama and one jacket um, since 4 a.m. By 2, 2.30 p.m., I reached two conclusions. The first conclusion, I'm absolutely useless there. I, I cannot, I'm, I'm not a surgeon. I'm just someone who's trying to survive this, his life. The second conclusion, I myself, I was in danger at that point, simply because by that time, I realized that there is no electricity in the city. There is no running water. There is no gas or any heating method in whole Gazi and Tab. By 2, 2.30 p.m., I was about three hours away from the sun coming down. And just to make things more fun, my phone, um, because I've been using my phone to reach out to all the hospitals, all my contacts in Syria, I'm reaching the end of my battery life. And I was at 20% at that time. And 20% battery life will make any of us freak out here in the US. So you can imagine my panic situation when I was there in Gaziantep with 20% battery, um, where the phone is the only way I could communicate with the outside world. So by 2, 2.30 p.m., I reach out the conclusion that now it's not about saving others' life, it's about saving my life at this point. So that's when I start sending the SOS messages. So um, here in the US, my wife, Iman, has been in touch with Gilbert and Marie, who have activated a wonderful evacuation plan. The only missing part is that evacuation plan will take about 12 hours before it starts to happen. Still, that wouldn't get me to stay alive overnight because, again, I'm drenched in water. I'm just wearing a pajama, and the temperature is 25 Fahrenheit. So if I stay outside overnight, there is no way I will make it through the night with those circumstances, and my phone is dying. So I, at this point, I had to calculate my next move very, very carefully. Every phone call I make, every text message I send will cost me 1% of my phone battery. So I had to be very calculated. Luckily, I thought of Amani, and I reached out to Amani. I sent her a text message, and that was maybe one of the best decisions in my life. Amani has been wonderful. So Gilbert and Marie saved my life, getting me outside of Turkey, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the one who, who truly, truly saved my life that night, who kept me alive, was Amani. Amani, for those who don't know her, she's like an activist. She has million contacts everywhere. She knows everywhere. She knows someone somewhere everywhere. So. She, she, I reached out to her and they told her, hey, listen, I'm, I'm kind of in trouble now. I don't know where to go. I have no place to, to, to be. I, I don't know what to do for overnight. And I need some help. Within half an hour, she sent me a message saying, someone will take care of you. Go to this location. Someone's name, Sarah, from the GIZ, will take care of you. She already knows you. She already expecting you, which is wonderful. The only catch is it's almost three o'clock. The location where the GIZ was about four miles away from where I was. Um, of course, there's no taxis, there's no cabs, nothing. Uh, and my phone, where I would use it for directions, I'm about 17% battery right now. So I, 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 I tried to use my short-term short -term memory as much as I could. 
So I turned on the Google map. I tried to memorize the name of the street and gas and tap as much as I could. I, I stared at the phone for a good two minutes, trying to memorize every street I would go through to reach where I should be, which is about four miles from where I was. And then I turned off my phone. So I alternated between jogging, running, walking, trying at the time. But I made it. It took me about three hours to reach the location where safety should be. Um, throughout the process, I got lost multiple times, of course. I had to turn on my phone again multiple times. So by the time I reached the location, my phone has already died. So, and, and that was where the ultimate desperation happened because now it's dark. It's 5.30 p.m. local time. The sun is down. It's still actively raining. Um, I'm alone. I have my wallet, but there is no cash, no credit card in the world that will help you at that time. Everything is closed. You can have all the money in the world. Nothing will help you. So my phone is dead. I reached the area where I should be, but I don't know which building is it exactly because there's no marks that says GIC. Um, so I spent the next hour knocking on every door in the area, shouting for help, saying, hey, listen, I'm looking for someone named Sarah. Amani has sent me. Please let me in. I got a lot of strange looks and strange like go away in Turkish and in English, but eventually I managed to, to find Sarah. Um, in that building, just like the rest of the city, there was no electricity, there was no running water, there was no heat, but at least there was a building, a building that hasn't cracked. Um, they have a decent shelter in the basement where you can hunker down. They don't have electricity, but they have um, a generator where they turn the electricity every few hours for a couple of hours. So I was able to um, charge my phone again, get back to connection to the um, real world and see what's going on between my wife, Marie and Gilbert. Luckily, you guys have been working literally nonstop to get me an evacuation route. Now, why is this important? Because of the earthquake, everything shut down. All the, all the roads and whatnot got damaged. The few roads that's still functional got closed for security reasons that the government rightfully so and that's the right move by the government by the turkish government has controlled the, the roads to decide who goes who where so you couldn't just jump on your car and start driving you have to go to special routes most of those routes were either damaged or packed so to go from adana to gas and tab usually takes about four hours i know someone who who tried that route and took him 16 hours so four hours, 16 hours to go that route. And, and that's where the beauty of being Johns Hopkins employee or, or affiliate, because you guys activated the um, evacuation plan, we could go through designated evacuation routes that is only allowed for evacuation vehicles. So I was lucky that they would let me go through special evacuation routes designated by Hopkins evacuation response, where I made it to Mardin, which is all the way to the west. Um, and then from Mardin, I spent a few days. Um, I, 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 when I reached there, um, I reached the hotel and I had the best meal in my life. <laughs> it was peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> and, and it was really delicious. And I drank some water. I had, by that time, I haven't had anything to eat or drink for almost two days because even at GIZ, they, it was an office building. They didn't have any food. They had some water, but it was very limited. So I got the best meal of my life, peanut butter and jelly. It was fantastic. And then after that, I spent a day or two in Mardin. And then I was flown to Istanbul. And then I, lucky I got um, reunited with my family a few days ago. The, the reason I'm saying all of this is, again, not to steal the spotlight, but this is me with all the elite support I can get in the world. I had Amani on one side, giving me, telling me where to go. I had Marie and Gilbert on the other side, setting up the most elite evacuation route I can ever get. Oh, thank you. I mean, it went right to the top. Yes, <laughs> thank you. But So and that's where it is a bittersweet moment. Like, as I'm saying this, I'm, I'm literally choking on this because, so I got all that support. I got the whole GHU on my back telling me, go here, don't do that. You will get your peanut butter jelly sandwich and whatnot. I got all of that and still I was miserable. I was multiple times i thought i'm not gonna make it multiple times i sent my my wife i love you because i didn't think i was gonna make it through that and that's with all the support i'm getting and this how my experience was so 
that's why it's a bit of a sweet moment because I, I don't know what people on the ground there who didn't have what I had, what, what they were going through. I really don't. I, I cannot even imagine that. So that's why I'm sharing my story. Sorry if I took um, a lot of time, but I, I just thought it's worth it to mention it, mention what it is. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Amani, for saving my life. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bara. Well, that was quite extraordinary. Um, and it is fascinating to be, you have the exact skills that are needed at that time, and you couldn't use them. And uh, yeah, I think we've, some of us have been in those positions. It's really difficult. But thank goodness you're back home and safe. Um, Amani, are you, she's there? I'm here. Hold on, we're going to see you hopefully in a second. Okay, Amani, um, while we're getting you on, on board, um, tell us a little bit about what your experience has been um, with your organization, SRD, um, particularly obviously working in, in Syria in a situation where their aid has not really been able to get through. And also, if you feel comfortable, what it was like for you as well uh, during this period. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, let me say a few things first. Um, I'm so happy to see, but uh, yeah. Um, I'm really glad you're alive. Kind of thanks to you, but yeah. <laughs> no, this time last year, actually, Gil, Paul, uh, Gil, uh, but and I were having uh, kebab and untap in the old city. Um, I want to start just by first giving condolences to the. Excuse me, I'm not going to be very articulate today, um, and Paul knows I can talk quite a bit. Um, I want to give condolences to everybody who's lost their lives, both from our Turkish. Turkish friends, colleagues, family, and on the Syrian, from the Syrian people as well. Um, to this day, we still have staff unaccounted for. Um, I've been in daily touch with, you know, some of our, the friend, the family of those colleagues. Um, and unfortunately, we've already lost a couple who have lost children, have lost their spouses. Um, so first and foremost, our hearts are with them, our prayers, um, and obviously to the incredible search and rescue teams that have been working day and night to get people out um, that are still under the rubble, many of which have not survived. Um, we were lucky, a few of my colleagues, um, actually just their, their entire families were trapped under the rubble and, and finally came out alive, but that ha has not been the case for, for many. Um, we're taking it day by day. Um, we've been on the ground over, you know, I think 12 years now, um, working in Syria and just generally the Middle East response. Um, and I think this just, this is unprecedented. I mean, we've been working in, and Gil alluded to this during his talk, this is a region that has been so affected by an existing conflict, protracted conflict. And we always talk about complex emergencies. We always talk about it in coursework, in, in you know, even some of our conversations in the Syria response and the Turkey response. And, you know, we talk about during COVID, we talk about cholera, we talk about aerial attacks to health infrastructure. What do we do when we need to evacuate a component of people? What do we do when there are a million people displaced, which happened between 2020 and 2021 in the middle of COVID due to major attacks to aerial in, um, to, to hospitals and clinics and schools and marketplaces. But right now, what we are struggling with is, is being able to respond to our own first responders. Gaziantep hub, Antakya or Hatay as it's often referred to, is, was, an, was another type of epicenter, sort of an epicenter of the humanitarian response for Northwest Syria. This is a massive hub with UN agencies, NGOs, first responders, working closely with the Turkish government, with AFAD, which is sort of the FEMA, if you will, of Turkey, a very, very close relationship with the Ministry of Health as well. So just watching this major epicenter of the response now be impacted, and first and foremost, trying to prioritize colleagues and teams who will have to mobilize soon after to respond to these needs has been unlike anything we've ever experienced, you know, relocating staff, finding staff, just understanding who's alive, who's where, where can we move individuals to, to so that we can quickly mobilize and respond because the reality is Northwest Syria and Southeast Turkey has endured so much already. When we look at our Northwest Syria response, 
we were already dealing with an impossible situation. We were dealing with people that have been displaced, not once, not twice, 15, 20, 25 times. So you can imagine the vulnerability we deal with, um, you know, not only hospitals and clinics and, and providing, you know, C-sections, but also just tremendous amounts of sexual violence, vulnerable populations, very vulnerable adolescents and children as well that are have been either recruited, um, are involved in child labor because of the economic deterioration in the region. So our priority right now is first to take care of our staff, because if we don't take care of them, they can't take care of others. I think that's one of our first things. Emotions are running high, obviously, every day. We're hearing news of other colleagues, friends, and family. But right now, for those in a leadership position, it's also, you know, beyond just crying a little bit and, 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 and seeking incredible support from people, including from the Hopkins community. I'm so touched by Paul and Gil and Shannon Ducey. I don't know if she's here today. Um, my advisor, um, Mia, um, you know, Len Rubenstein, like individuals that have just personally reached out. Um, it's been, excuse me, so appreciated and it just, it helps to know that there's a community behind you um, because we have to be strong for people who need us, need us right now. Um, I will not derail the conversation by my own sort of, I, I have an apartment in Gaziantep, I live there most of the year, by some you know miracle, I, I happened to delay my flight a few days, but I and I were supposed to get dinner. And then I told them I ended up moving my, um, my flight by chance, um, you know, and sometimes these things happen by chance and I, I know what I need to do and, and, and with others. And it's it's just important to stay focused on a few things, you know, and I know people all keep asking, what can we do? How can we help? You know, there's things we can do. There's th things we can't do in this situation. The complexity of this environment is unfathomable. I mean, the level of vulnerability now by just a situation that is completely out of anyone's control, a natural disaster. I mean, they will be writing about this for for decades just in terms of how to respond to this because this is the precedent this is the reality of many other places in the world right now oftentimes for those working on either middle east or syria response or ukraine you know every crisis is sort of a microcosm it's a bubble you feel it's the only crisis no one knows what's going on outside no one appreciates this no one appreciates how fragile and and complex this situation is this is the situation in many places. Paul and I were just in South Sudan, you know, less than a month or two ago. Um, we're, you know, when you look at vulnerability and displacement and violent conflict uh, and climate crises and natural disasters compounding on some of the most vulnerable people in the world, we need to change the blueprint for how we respond. We need to support local organizations, local first responders on the ground to equip them at ground zero because they are the ones who are affected, they are the ones who stay behind. I know there's a tremendous amount of international support right now. I will not criticize sort of the delay in how we're responding to crises around the world, including what's happening in Turkey and Syria right now. But we also need to move past the politicization of crises. We need to move humanitarian agendas to the top. Every minute, every hour, every day we waste is, is, is preventing more lives from being saved. And that's our mandate. First saving lives and then understanding, like Barat said, how can we give people safe shelter and food and warmth and basic amenities to let to ensure that they can survive in the next few days in that acute phase of an emergency? And then we think long term. We're looking at a very dark period of a few months right now. We're doing all we can. But also we need to think about practical steps. I'm a person who's very operational. I am thinking about duty of care. I am thinking about how we can protect our teams. Essentially, sometimes this is referred to as hazard pay or danger pay. How can we protect our teams right now that have been affected um, beyond just a small stipend to make sure that they, you know, they can fix a few, patch up their apartment? How can we provide mental health services to first responders? How can we do, and this is something I've appreciated from Hopkins, is that systems level thinking. When there's systemic failure, there needs to be systemic level thinking and cross application and certainly multilateral diplomacy, which I know I sound like a bureaucrat right now, but it is absolutely essential. Whole nations, whole governments react. It is disheartening when you see planes flying in, 
to areas that have been affected and then other areas where there's such a saturation of populations completely neglected. And that is a failure of the international community, to be honest. It's an obligation because it could also happen in our backyard. And we saw this during COVID and we've seen it during multiple crises that have happened in the US. I have a direct line with the head of the UN um, Office for Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs or OCHA, because it is the time to leverage all of the relationships we have to push and advocate for com communities, not who are voiceless, because I hate it when people imply that they don't have a voice, but who are simply incapacitated right now. And I apologize, I'm a bit passionate right now, but there is mass hysteria and we need to mobilize, we need to respond. And I hope, and I, and I hate to use this as a lesson, but we also need to be documenting what we're doing right now, finding out how we can apply this to other inevitable crises that are going to happen. I'm gonna stop there because my heart's been racing. I'm sorry for, for about 10 days and I haven't gotten much sleep, but I appreciate you for having this and spotlighting this and the incredible platform that Hopkins has and, and the colleagues and the friends and the students and the cohort um, that have reached out. So, so thank you. Yeah, over Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Amani. Don't worry, you can relax when we're in Mali together. Um, okay, Aral, over to you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I want to briefly share what we were doing when 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 the earthquake uh, track, but just to let you know, I am from Hatay, one of the uh, worst uh, affected regions uh, in Turkey next to Syria. So when I say it, really did hit home, it's, it's a literal um, thing to say. Um, so right before, a couple hours before the earthquake, actually our teams were gathering in Adana because we were starting a pilot with the refugee population uh, in the region. And actually one of our, our, uh, our field workers who is from Hatay uh, was, is only alive because she left her house a couple hours before the earthquake to join our teams in Adana. Um, but to, to sort of, um, since my colleagues have made it very obvious for me, I was lucky enough that my fam family survived and no one was hurt but all the places that I remember from my childhood are just gone under the rubble. So, so the, the way it's, I've seen it being put in, in social media in Turkish is there is no Hatay anymore. And this is similar in many cities. Um, and I'm imagining it's similar in Syria, although I'm not in a position to you know, share more about Syria. One thing I also want to highlight and, and thank the JHU community is that we often talk about sort of social and political determinants of health, but it's also important to highlight the social, political, economical, financial determinants of, of disasters and uh, such as these natural disasters, which is only compounded by the by the the regulations and everything that has been put forth uh, before earthquake. Um, so I just wanted to thank that it is it is uh, mentioned here in this in this call. Uh, as Professor Spiegel mentioned, um, I do work in humanitarian. I did work as a search and rescue and medical personnel in Turkey for quite some time before moving to the U.S. to do my DRPH. Um, and I currently lead an organization that helps refugees connect to local healthcare systems. So what we've been able to do uh, during the earthquake is really ramp up our efforts in the field to help not just refugees, but everyone uh, affected to the, to the services available by the nonprofits, by the INGOs, by the government and everything. And I think it is, it is great that, that, that the, the, the availability and accessibility of mobile phones are mentioned here because they are a lifeline. Um, and that they do offer a great uh, sort of way to to connect with the people um, in, in these kind of situations. So I'm not going to uh, go more into the details about my own personal lived experiences, because I think my colleagues, colleagues made the, the, the point very clear. Um, I'm flying back to Turkey to lead our teams who, have, who are finalizing search and rescue 
uh, today, but now uh, supporting the enrollment, uh, rolling out of our humanitarian aid programs. Um, so I just want to give the space for, for uh, back for people to ask questions if they want to. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, one of the most unexpected uh, aspects, I think, at working at Hopkins is um, how much when we, we we're here, Bara, Aral, and Amani are students and their life experiences and their professional experience are extraordinary. And, you know, I joined Hopkins six and a half years ago, and I don't think I really expected the, um, I guess, the, the amount of um, learning, I, I, I sometimes it seems silly to call them students because we are learning as much from them as uh, they are for us. So they're, they're really inspirational. And I want to really just recognize that and recognize you all. So why don't we start with some questions or uh, comments? Majid, are you around? Yes. There's a, a right over there, Mike. And please introduce yourself. Can you hear me? First, uh, my name is Maj Algatrif. I'm on the medical faculty here, but uh, I'm thrilled to see you, my friend. He's a close, dear friend. I didn't know you were there. I'm thrilled to see you sound and alive. Amani, also, sorry for all the losses you had. Um, and Earl, also, thanks for the safety for your family. Um, it's been a tragedy for all of us. Uh, we all have a survival guilt now. Uh, and it's inspirational how the whole Syria thing kind of comes down. We are divided across a zillion schism, but suddenly united by pain. And, and you will see people from the tip southern part of Syria, people we were raising funds for, uh, just to make their 15% uh, uh, minimum wage, not minimum wage, but like living life, poverty line. Now they are donating uh, 10,000 Syrian pounds, which is like a fraction of like 25 cents, their clothes for their brothers up in the devastated areas. I just want to take kind of this moment. I hope all these borders just go. People actually defied borders. I know people from my town in Sweden, they went to Idlib because people find paths to help others in need. Uh, I hope just we can scale that up and take that moment. I come from a background of health and peace. I, if this didn't come bring us closer, I don't know what would. Again, thank you for all the great work. Thanks, Paul, for putting this together. Um, and, and hopefully it's a, it's a disaster that will uh, break as, from along with all the structures that it destroyed to break all the barriers that came among us. Thank you very much. While we're waiting, uh, Bara, I wanted to ask you, given what you've seen now and in a way how you had the skills, but were not able to, to use them at that time, what have you learned or what would you consider doing differently in the future? Not you yourself, but maybe the system. So, and that's a wonderful point to raise because a lot of time we in public health, we get desperate about what we are doing. And we often ask ourselves, is what we are doing, is it really helpful? Is it saving lives? What happened in Northwest Syria, that's a wonderful example and should be an uplifting story to anyone who ever questioned him or herself. So all the relief work that happened in Northwest Syria, all of it, for the first six days, there was zero, absolutely zero international involvement. All of that was done by Syrian people on the ground. They got some help from people like Amani on the Turkish side, but the actual work in Northwest Syria was done by Syrian people. Zero international involvement for six days. The first UN convoy crossed the borders to Syria on day six. Why am I saying this? I think that should give us some hope. And maybe that's the silver lining in all of this. Whatever we are doing, whatever we are doing here, you've been going back and forth multiple times to Gazi and Tab. All the things that Amani Gilbert has been doing it wasn't wasted. Clearly, the fact that there was such a wonderful organized response in Northwest Syria by the Syrian people with zero international involvement tells me that whatever 
Amani has been doing for the last 11 years, what you've been doing back and forth to Gazi and Cap, it didn't go into waste. There was some result. There was some actual organized work that came because of all of this support that we, not me personally, but Amani and Gilbert and everyone doing this has been building for the last 10 years. So I think that's a wonderful, I shouldn't say wonderful, that's the silver lining in all of this. It's, it, it's still a disaster, but at least there is some light where you can see there is some benefit to what we've been doing for the last 12 years. I just like to pick up on something that Amani said and also what uh, what Barra just said, and that is building the community's capacity to respond. And one of the most interesting things that I saw was work that was done in Israel. And there, local community organizations had courses on or classes on how do you rescue people using carjacks, using things around the house. Uh, things that were readily available, not depending on these big pieces of machinery that may or may not show up in, in various places. So I think it's a good lesson. So we think about how do we help people to be more empowered uh, to address these type of issues and themselves? And how do we work with local organizations to approach this? Thank you. I, I think one of the other big issues that comes up consistently is um, how can we get funding in these situations to those local organizations? There's, there's already enough problems because of sanctions in, in Syria proper, but even when there are not sanctions, um, even in, in uh, with the Ukraine crisis in Europe, all the money is still going primarily through UN and international NGOs, which is not the most efficient way, obviously, to move forward, but there aren't very easy ways to make sure that that money is uh, is being sent to these local organizations. Paul, can I say something to that? Can I speak to that? Please do. Yeah, this is an absolute vital point. I mean, localization, for those who aren't familiar with it, is really supporting local responders, local capacity communities to where when this happens, they are able to mobilize. And that's what's been so incredible about this. And so many people keep asking, you know, we see trusted international names, credible, legitimate organizations, but the Syria response has been primarily led by local actors on the ground. When I say local, for example, SRD, we, we're, we're a diaspora organization. We're headquartered in America. We're 501c3. But local means we're operating directly on the ground. White helmets operating directly on the ground. They are leading tremendous search and rescue efforts. These are the individuals who are on the ground who are left behind and will have to be capacitated so that they can respond immediately. We have partners with every single international agency you can imagine, UN, WHO, uh, UNFPA, um, incredible INGO partners. But the reality is most of that funding, when you channel it, it will eventually reach a local organization on the ground. And oftentimes, I, I'm not saying cut out the middleman, but sometimes you do need to cut out the middleman. When you support local efforts, most of that is channeled to direct service operations on the ground. We cannot do this without partnership, especially from a technical standpoint and that long-term expertise of cross-application from different crises. Um, but we also need to recognize this was a highly localized response before. It is to this day, I have international organizations who are contacting me saying, we can't go in, but what can we give you guys? And that's the reality. That's how it's going to remain because it's a highly politicized, contentious environment. And we need to keep that in mind. Um, and, and just two points for people who are saying, how can I also help? Please don't go there unless you're a search and rescue person, unless you are a technical lead at a you know large international organization like the WHO, you should not be parachuting in. Um, we've already had people kind of parachute in and say, can someone set up my logistics for me and can a taxi pick me up and can you send me to a hotel? Please do not go there. You will only be detrimental to the response and please try to minimize sending. I know there's incredible donation drives all over the country right now. We do not want to dismantle the local economies in some of these places. Please don't send massive donation drives with things that may not even be nuanced, contextually appropriate, culturally appropriate, and are simply not what individuals need right now who, who, are, who are recovering and surviving this earthquake over thank you yeah that's um something that we get yeah constantly. maybe uh, oh please Arel. One, one thing to add uh because it's, it's an experience that we're exp uh, like having right now uh some of the the uh, international donors who uh didn't want to donate to us ended up having to work with us in the field through four different kind of 
organization. So, um, you know, INGO donating to another INGO has a contact in Turkey who is a larger national NGO, but doesn't have any ground experience, who is kind of sort of contracting or subawarding us while in the beginning we uh, did contact that INGO. So there is a barrier of, of four different uh, sort of trickling down of, of the grants uh, until it comes to the field, just as an experience that uh, we are seeing at the moment. Just wanted to share that experience. Yeah, thank you, Aral. I mean, it's it's astonishing still how we have such inefficiencies within the, the aid system. Um, online, if there's anyone, I, I saw there were some comments, Noreen Hack, I believe, and others. If you want to say something, unmute yourself, please feel free. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Dr. Noreen Hawk, uh, an alumnus and, and part of all of you. Uh, and thank you for this very, very in-depth conversation today. On my own, actually, I was starting to get um, help from, uh, like, you know, kind of contacted Turkish Embassy, started to get help from my colleague physicians, um, uh, started a support group, and also started to see if my electronic medical record system, which I, we had developed, like my native countries in Bangladesh, so we are using this electronic medical record in a very low-cost resource in rural Bangladesh. So I was hoping that I can actually reciprocate that same electronic medical record registration system requiring just iPad or like in you know, a mobile phones on the center in, in the base camps. And I was actually sending a separate email to Amani because thanks for uh, Amani sharing your email to the chat group to see how I can take it offline. I didn't want to use a lot of your time, but this is something from a resolution standpoint from the our aftermath and from addressing the needs of the medical, like the you know, medical needs of the people, the victims, even the medical professionals, rescuers, how can we have a sustainable uh, tele platform where patients can still get help from psychologists, although they cannot physically reach there. So I think, you know, this is something that we can think of. Um, I don't want to take much of your time, but thank you for giving me the platform. I would like to share my thoughts with you um, and, and get more guidance from you and especially like, you know, get the support of the leaders who are already there working, how I can be of more help. Thank you so much. I appreciate your kind uh, time for me. Thank you, Dr. Noreen. Noreen. Paul, can um, I speak to that and just answer Len's question? Yes. Yes, hi, Len. Hi, hi. Thank just, you just for very your quickly, talk. Dr. Noreen, um, thank you for that. We'll connect offline. There's already sort of an operational system called DHIS2 that functions in Northwest Syria, but health information systems are absolutely important right now because certainly that's a bit fragmented right now. Lens, yes. this is your space. You know this more than I do in terms of, you know, when, when we hear a State of the Union address, I'm not going to politicize this, but we don't hear um, even an acknowledgement or condolences to victims of an earthquake, it's a, it's a bit disturbing. I mean, I say that as an American right now. Um, what we have talked about in the policy space related to what the US can do, and you know this probably more than I do, is Presidential Drawdown Authority, the Department of Defense and others who have, as you said, some of the greatest logistics, engineering, aerial power in the world are able to support. Um, so I can't speak to that, unfortunately. Um, because there, there just isn't much happening. There isn't ha enough happening and there isn't happening fast enough, especially for a country such as the US that has some of the greatest resources um, and leverage in the world. Um, but I'll let you sort of speak to that because I know this is your space. I don't have any information. I just think it's shocking that uh, the US military isn't going into help, that US aid isn't going on, uh, in with its teams with expertise in all the kinds of needs that exist in Syria and seem to be deferential to the limited border, border crossing. Uh, has anything happened since the earthquake uh, took place to change no. that no. passivity? No, on, uh, you know, on, on the UN side, UNDAC teams have just gone in, disaster assistance coordination teams, I think just went in. So we're talking almost 10 days later. Um, in terms of the US side, no. And I, I also know this sort of, um, until from others who are who, who work at DOD and, and and whatnot is you know they have that authority they have that ability and we need to also push from that policy standpoint I know many of you there in the DC you know um, space that's something that needs to be pushed is what is the U.S. also going to do um, to support this but certainly 
nothing. I know on the US, USAID side, obviously, as a donor, um, sort of working to mobilize response and respond. But with other things, we're also still at the point where we're being asked for concept notes in the middle of an emergency. Um, so right now, we're also trying to be really protective of, you know, it is not time for bureaucracy. It's important to be financial stewards of the donated dollar, of course, 100%. Um, but we need to cut through some of that admin admin um, that is getting in the way of, of mobilizing response faster. Over. Thank you, everyone. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. This was one hour, and it's it's one hour now. So, um, Gilbert, Bara, Amani, Aral, thank you so very much for um, for your time and um, sharing everything with us. And um, also, just a big thanks to to Hopkins, uh, or to Alan and Marie, and everyone else who have been um, supporting uh, the students. And um, yeah, they're they're. Sadly, we see a lot of repetition of what's happening now. It's not new. We've been seeing it in so many different places, and um, it can be frustrating for those of us that um, just keep on seeing the same problems, the same issues. Um, we're all aware of them, but it seems that the bureaucracy and the administration and the politics consistently gets in the way. Thank you, everyone. Have a, a wonderful rest of the day, and we're, of course, thinking about everyone in, in Syria and Turkey at this time. Thank you all. Thank you. Be safe. Bye-bye. Yeah.